Abdullah Shaib speaking to you from WHO headquarters in Geneva and welcoming you to our global COVID-19 press conference today, Friday 6 November. We have the privilege to welcoming three health ministers from Indonesia, South Africa and Thailand. Unfortunately, the minister of Uzbekistan is no longer able to join us as planned. The health ministers will share their country's experiences on preparedness and response to COVID-19. I will let Dr. Tedros introduce their excellencies. The Director General, uh, Dr. Tedros, will be joining us remotely. Uh, present in the room are Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director, Health Emergencies, Dr. Maria von Kerkov, Technical Lead for COVID-19, Dr. Stella Chiongong, Director, Health Security Preparedness, Dr. Jawad Mahzur, Assistant Director, General Emergency Preparedness, Mr. Steve Solomon, Principal Legal Officer. In the room also is Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, Chief Scientist, Dr. Maria Angela Simao, Assistant Director, General Access to Medicines and Health Products. Welcome all. Simultaneous interpretation is provided in the six UN official languages plus uh, Portuguese and Hindi. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to our Director General, Dr. Tedros, for his opening remarks and for him to introduce our guests. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. I think you are uh, uh, muted, Dr. Tedros. Dr. Tedros, can you hear me? He's talking. He's talking. Yeah. He's muted. You are, you are muted, Dr. Tedros. Can you hear me now? Ah, good. <laughs> Go ahead, please. I think there is a few minutes uh, lapse, I, a pause, pause time, I think. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. In the summer, Africa is certified as wild polio free. This marked one of the greatest public health achievements of all time. Driven by millions of health workers reaching every child repeatedly with an effective vaccine and a unique partnership between WHO, UNICEF, Rotary, CDC, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Gavi, global polio eradication remains achievable. However, the COVID-19 pandemic hurt momentum as polio and immunization efforts were suspended. This left children, especially in high-risk areas, more vulnerable to killer diseases like polio, measles, and pneumonia. And now we are starting to see outbreaks of this disease. We need to turn the tide quickly and ensure no child is left behind. Today, WHO and UNICEF are jointly launching an emergency appeal to rapidly boost measles and polio vaccination. While the world watches intently as scientists work to ensure safe and effective vaccines are developed for COVID-19, it's important to ensure that all children receive the life-saving vaccines that are already available. We estimate that 655 million US dollars is needed to address dangerous immunization gaps in children in non-GAVI eligible countries. This is a global call to action for all donors to stay the course and not to turn their backs on the poorest and most marginalized children in their hour of need. While the COVID-19 pandemic continues to evolve, 
we must take all opportunities to learn and improve the response as we go. Many countries heard our call back in January when we rang our highest alarm by calling a public health emergency of international concern. They worked closely with us and followed the parameters set out in the strategic response plan that WHO outlined on the 4th February. They have conducted reviews, shared data and experience, and honed their response to their national experience and unique situation on the ground. As the pandemic unfolds, as countries have reflected, they have used interaction reviews to make their responses stronger. This kind of self-analysis review is what the world called for during World Health Assembly back in May. An interaction review uses a whole of society, multi-sectoral approach, acknowledging the contributions of all relevant stakeholders involved in COVID-19 preparedness and response at the national and subnational levels. By reviewing and adapting the current preparedness and response strategies, and identifying what's working well and what needs to be strengthened. The review gives countries the opportunity to change the trajectory of the pandemic. <laughs> Interaction reviews not only help countries improve their COVID-19 response, but also contribute towards their long-term health security. To date, 21 countries have completed them and others are in pipeline. Today, we're happy to welcome the ministers of health from Indonesia, the Kingdom of Thailand and South Africa to share their experience and lessons from COVID-19. I would like to first introduce His Excellency, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Health of the Kingdom of Thailand, Minister, Deputy Prime Minister Anutin Sharnidirakul. The floor is yours, uh, Your Excellency. Dr. Ted Loss, Director General of the World Health Organization, Health Ministers, colleagues, members of the press, I send you greetings from Thailand. As you know, Thailand was the first country outside of China to detect the case of COVID-19. And since then, we have been working around the clock to prevent the spread of the disease. Several strategies are employed, such as comprehensive case identification, rigorous contact tracing, and quarantine. Thai people are well complied with the social measures of wearing masks, hand hygiene, and physical distancing, resulting in effective controlling of the spread of COVID-19 in our country. We have maintained a zero, zero local transmission for many months. Nowadays, few cases were detected in the quarantine area. We are well aware of the need to continuously improve response to COVID-19 to protect the health of all people across the globe, including Thailand. So the Joint Intra-Action Review of Thailand's response to COVID-19 was critical. It was conducted during July 20th to July 24th by 16 reviewers from diverse backgrounds, ranging the experts from WHO, UN agencies, US CDC, and to the Academia. I thank the review panel who interviewed 96 Thai policymakers, technical experts, and respondents, and all relevant persons who contributed to this review. The, review, the reviewers made their observations and recommendations based on consensus. They highlighted the factors that helped Thailand successfully control the spread of COVID-19 so far. That include decisive leadership 
based on the base scientific at evidence available, our strong public health system, and the strong whole of society approach across sectors. Cooperation and collaboration with all concerned sectors among the public and private sectors, civil society, and many institutions played important roles in breaking the chains of transmission. My highest appreciation is going to everyone in Thailand for their collective effort in curtailing the outbreak in our country. Besides our strengths, the review identifies that challenges for further improvement. First is to integrate information around COVID-19 and maximize its benefit. Second is to expand our surveillance systems by improving capacity to detect cases and increasing more efficiency of our emergency operation centers. Third is to advance the integrated digital data system for managing the situation and ensuring health security for everyone on Thai soil. Distinguished colleagues, IAR report reminds us the strengths that we need to maintain. At the same time, it advises us that the challenges we need is to address. We commit to improving our response to COVID-19 by working closely with relevant stakeholders. In this regard, I would like to thank all of our partners who have worked with us on the report including WHO, various UN agencies, USCDC, and national colleagues in the academic sector. My special thanks is going to my colleagues at the Ministry of Public Health and all health workers who provide services across Thailand. Finally, I appreciate the role of the media and in disseminating and advocating news and information that helps us communicate with the public more effectively to prevent the spread of the disease. Only together can we win the COVID-19 pandemic, and we shall win. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> so thank you, thank you so much, Deputy Prime Minister, for those insightful remarks and lessons regarding Thailand's response. I would now like to welcome His Excellency, Minister of Health, South Africa, Dr. Zuelini Mikize. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Director General, uh, my brother, Dr. Tedros. Honorable ministers, uh, representatives from the various countries in the departments of health, and members of the media and the public, I'd like someone to help me share the slides uh, from your side, if that is possible. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to just take a quick walk through our journey on the COVID-19, and therefore I'd like to go to the next slide. This the. Uh, presentation is just going to give us a quick overview and then why are we going to interaction review what lessons have we learned and way forward next slide please this gives us a sense of the journey of the south african COVID the fight against COVID. all the red lines there indicate how we've moved on the heavy lockdown and went downwards <clears throat> in a a risk adjusted way until we got to level three. And then of course, uh, you'll see that that's when the surge started early in June, and then up to July when we're 13,000 13, uh, test positive test per day, and then it started declining. <clears throat> and thereafter, when it was to plateau, went to the next level of the lockdown. We've continued on a plateau now, and at this point we've even started opening up international travel. Next slide. <clears throat> At this point, we have got uh, 15, 1,500 to 2,000 daily new positive cases, 732,000 cumulative cases, 91% uh, recovery, and 2.7% uh, 
um, uh, fatality rate and 41,000 active cases. Thank you. Next slide. <clears throat> this is the toolkit. I think all of us have used this from governance to case management, to tracing, to tracking, to information, to human resources, and all the issues that we've had to employ. Next slide. Through this uh, uh, interaction review and uh, on our own evaluation going back, we've learned a lot of lessons. Firstly, that the issues of national coordination, leadership, and governance uh, with various structures become important. Evidence-based response is important to ensure that science leads everything. The, the strengthening of emergency procurement processes, <clears throat> excuse me, to mitigate against corruption. Strong primary health care is important. Issues of fatigue must be given attention to. Close collaboration with labor and other social partners. Public-private partnership is important. Harnessing of power of technology, digital contact tracing, is also important and information dissemination and uh, issues of continued vigilance and aggressive response to cluster outbreaks, continued assessment of capacity of projected multi-sectoral and multifactorial impact. It's important to know that we need everybody to be touched by our response on this matter. The economic, economic impact is, is a major issue. The country and the citizens and the poor have to be protected and that the impact of COVID uh, and, and non-COVID health services is also something that we have to take into account. Next slide. <clears throat> this is how, as we observe uh, uh, at sub-national level, we've still kept the plateau, but there are indications of clusters breaking up and showing a slight increase in some of the areas. And so we're watching over that, and that's why the inter-action uh, review becomes important. Next slide. And the concerns that we have to take into account at this point, uh, which is why we have to focus on this inter-action review, is that there is pandemic fatigue in the population with low adherence to public health measures, exhaustion and fatigue in the frontline workers, whom we must thank for all the work uh, that they have taken in, uh, in fighting this COVID-19, even if they themselves became uh, victims, ensuring that they are well protected, well trained and well motivated. And then, of course, we keep into, uh, take into account the possible resurgence that can be made worse by the factors above. And also the delay in the vaccine still keeps us vulnerable. And then, of course, resources which are dwindling. And we've had to move resources from various other functions of government to actually help to fight the, the, the pandemic. So these are some of the issues that we are now taking into account. Next slide. <clears throat> So in our case, uh, we have, uh, we're very grateful for the support of our international partners led by the WHO using the WHO methodology. We volunteered to work on this and we've gone right to uh, involve already eight of the nine provinces have already conducted their intra-action review. And then uh, we've got a team of 35 WHO search personnel who have come in to reinforce our uh, technical experts on the ground. Next slide. Of the lessons that I've indicated before, amongst the issues we've looked at is that uh, uh, the value add of interaction uh, uh, review is that it shows us best practices. It enable, enables us to be able to record these and put them into across all pillars and then institutionalize them. It also helps us to identify gaps uh, in this case <clears throat> to ensure that our next response uh, is actually seamless the next is the revision of the response plans, that uh, we have uh, plans which are now loca localized at lowest local level at districts so that everyone is able to respond without waiting uh, for uh, the national response, but they must know what they need to do. Then, of course, there are long-term recommendations that have been put in place, uh, and then we're looking at this with continuous follow-ups. So it's a whole cycle now of response, interaction review, resurgence readiness, and of course, response, and that continues. And uh, this is now what we are preparing for, and we believe uh, the support of WHO has been very helpful to make us to be ready psychologically to face whatever comes as the next resurgence uh, possibly comes up. Next slide. And here, learning from other countries that are experiencing COVID resurgence, uh, measures have been taken to prepare for, detect, to promptly respond to the resurgence, there is a national plan now for action 
to mitigate COVID-19 resurgence, which has been developed. Provinces are currently developing their resurgence mitigation plans. They didn't incorporate early warning systems, as I was saying, broken down right to the district level. And all the provinces now are remaining on high alert. And so every day as we watch, we look at where the clusters are breaking up. We've seen in the western part of the country, eastern, eastern part of the country. Uh, all of these are indicating our state of alertness. And this is now based on the plan from the uh, WHO uh, research, uh, resurgence plan. Next slide. Yeah, we've just got a indi quick indicator. <clears throat> Everyone has to look out for anything that's less, less than 10% increase or decrease. is under control. Between 10 and 20, it puts us on alert. Now we're looking out for more over 20% increase. That's indicating resurgence. And this, uh, these are some of the key uh, lessons that we have got from our uh, um, uh, intra-action uh, uh, review and the plans that we have developed together with the WHO as our partners. Next slide. So basically our recommendation is that intra-action reviews are valuable exercises that enable countries to recalibrate their responses. And in this case, in South Africa, it has really benefited us greatly. And the intra-action uh, uh, intra uh, reviews provide great inputs for adjusting the system and plans for readiness for a potential resurgence and the issue of continuous engagement with communities and all the partners at local and international level uh, ensures that we are able to you know, uh, strengthen our uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as social distancing, wearing of masks, hand and respiratory hygiene. You need the community to respond at that level. And lastly, we, we still, uh, the COVID-19 is still within us and therefore need to remain vigilant to continue to fight together. We are quite, quite clear that it needs an all community, all government, and everybody's uh, participation to fight. And the strength of the intra-action uh, uh, reviews is to actually revive that understanding amongst all of us so that as we move on, we are actually better prepared to respond. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share the ideas. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister Mikhezi. Thank you so much for sharing South Africa's determined efforts to tackle COVID-19. I would now like to turn to the Minister of Health of Indonesia, Dr. Terawan Agus Putranato. Minister Putranato, the floor is yours. Dr. Tedros, Director General of the World Health Organization, my fellow colleagues, Minister of Health from Thailand and South Africa, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, afternoon, and evening. It is a pleasure to be invited and participate in today's event. The Ministry of Health of the Republic of Indonesia supported by WHO Indonesia Country Office, has conducted a national interaction review for COVID-19 response on 11 till 14 August 2020. The IER is an immediate follow-up of the fourth IHR COVID-19 Emergency Committee meeting recommendation that was held in July 2020. Surely it is not an easy task to bring representative of 138 multi-sectoral stakeholders to conduct a review of the existing COVID-19 response activities in Indonesia. However, under the leadership of President Joko Widodo, and the coordination of the COVID-19 Task Force Chief, General Luhut Binsar Panjaitan, representative from the technical unit within the Ministry of Health, other related ministries and government agencies, the national and regional COVID-19 Task Force, military and police forces, provincial and district government, 
hospital and primary health service facilities, laboratories, universities, professional association, state-owned enterprises, and international organization have been committed and been actively involved and contribute to the whole process of the IER. The involvement of the multi-sectoral stakeholder on the review is imperative in gaining a multi-perspective view of the COVID-19 response in Indonesia. This is particularly important because the IER in Indonesia covers the nine key pillars of the COVID-19 response, which consists of the pillar of one, command and coordination. Second, risk communication and community empowerment. Three, surveillance, rapid response team, and case investigation. Fourth, point of entry, international travel and transport. Five, laboratory. Six, infection control. Seven, case management. Eight, operational and logistic support. And nine, maintaining essential health services and system. Indeed, active participation of such multi-stakeholder is a key for a success IER. Equally important, the multi-sectoral involvement in the IER has also increased the acceptability of the IER recommendation by all stakeholders. As a result, the IER recommendation has been used in the revised COVID-19 health sector operational plan at the national and subnational level, as well as in updating the COVID-19 partner platform. IER recommendations contribute to the improvement of the multi-sectoral stakeholder command and coordination at the national and subnational level. It also strengthens the periodic monitoring of response plan indicator including surveillance and laboratory coordination, as well as improved contact tracing, testing, and triage at health facilities to avoid exposure of patients and the health workforce to COVID-19. Enforcing the implementation and monitoring of large-scale social restriction and empowering the community as agent for change through COVID-19 key messaging and engagement were also considered as one of the area for improvement. Furthermore, the IER suggested improving telemedicine to prevent COVID-19 exposure and maintain essential health services such as immunization, tuberculosis, its IV, and non-communicable diseases program as part of ensuring the continuity of essential health services. Indonesia, which also include the IER result as a reference for the AHR State Party Annual Reporting in the 74 WHE. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia is of the few that reviewing the operation plan of COVID-19 response through the multi-sector stakeholder interaction review is one of the best practice to collectively identify best practice gaps and contributing factor for correction action in the COVID-19 response Ever. From our point of view, the result of the IER review has provided input for Indonesia to improve multi-sectoral preparedness coordination in line with the multi-sectoral preparedness coordination framework that was published by WHO 
in May 2020 to strengthen coordination for a better health emergency preparedness. Thank you. Terima kasih banyak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Terima kasih. Uh, hi, we are trying to connect uh, with Dr. Tedros, so um, uh, I hope it will be solved very shortly and quickly. Dr. Tedros, we lost you, but we are trying to fix the problem. Um, so we um, we are trying to uh, connect again with Dr. Uh, Tedros, but uh, once we are trying to fix this, I would like to remind journalists uh, to raise their hands if they want to ask a question to get in the queue. And I would like also to make uh, to ask them to uh, unmute. Uh, Dr. Tedros is back. I was told. Dr. Tedros, are you with us? Dr. Tedros? <laughs> Dr. Tedros, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, very well, DG. Go ahead, please. After, uh, I think, the interruption, it needs 30 seconds to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> That's the uh, configuration. So I was uh, hearing your voice, but not mine. OK, so I was saying terima uh, kasih to His Excellency Minister Putranato uh, for sharing Indonesia's efforts uh, to suppress COVID-19. Your Excellency, terima kasih again. By conducting reviews in real time and sharing lessons to the world, the three countries have reflected a blueprint for how countries can suppress COVID-19 and break the chains of transmission. You can do exercises, you can do simulations, but the best time to look at your emergency response capacity is when an emergency is happening. That's when you can clearly see what works, what doesn't, and what you need to improve. There is hope, and now is the time to double down on efforts to tackle this virus. Wherever a country is in terms of the outbreak, countries can turn it around by driving a whole of government and whole of society response. It's never too late. While we invest and test vaccines to prove they're safe and effective, I encourage all countries to learn from Thailand, South Africa, and Indonesia and work to suppress this virus today with the tools in hand that we know work. We can save lives and livelihoods and end this pandemic together. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros and our uh, distinguished you, guests. Um, I will now open the floor to questions from members of the media. I remind you that you need to raise your hand by using the hand function, the raise your hand function in order to get in the queue. And please make sure you are unmuted. And please uh, reminding journalists to ask only one question. Uh, we will start uh, the session, question and answer session, with uh, Stephen Howard from Travel News Asia. Stephen, can you hear me? 
Genau. Steven? Steven, can you hear me? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, hello, uh, <laughs> you can ask your question. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, and thank you for taking my question, and thank you for all the work that the WHO does. My question is for Kun Anutin. Uh, Thailand is currently looking at reducing the quarantine from 14 days to 10 days. I would like to ask, please, what is the research behind this when do you expect that to happen? And what are your thoughts on such a reduction, please? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Howard. Um, Mr. Um, Sharvira Kul, do you want to answer this question? Minister of Thailand. No. Um, I think we are uh, trying to um, contact again the Honorable Minister of Thailand. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Dr. Vinberg Kerkhoff can uh, try to answer this question. Go ahead. So thanks. While we try to get while we try to get them back, um, there is uh, there have been some questions about the quarantine period now. This is the time in which um, a contact of a confirmed case needs to be separated from other individuals. We call that quarantine. And WHO's recommendation on this is based on what we know of the incubation period, which is the time from exposure to the time that someone develops symptoms. Um, our guidance for incubation period is, is 14 days, and that's based on the amount of time that most individuals, 95% of individuals, will develop symptoms um, after exposure. Um, and so uh, what we've outlined is this 14-day period, and there are some countries that are discussing the possibility of reducing that time period based on a number of factors um, associated with their response and the capacity to provide supported quarantine. Um, what we understand from a number of countries is that if they do reduce that 14-day period, they're considering adding testing as part of that. Um, but there is a balanced uh, approach that if there is a reduction in that 14-day period, there are some risks that are associated with that in terms of missing uh, the potential cases onward. So um, what we have is, is our outline based on the science and based on uh, what is understood to be that incubation period. That's where that 14-day comes from. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Kate Killand. Kate, can you hear me? Okay. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Very well. Go ahead, please. Hi, thank you for taking my question. I'm interested in uh, what's happening with um, mink farms um, in various parts of the world. Um, we've had a uh, major cull in Denmark announced this week. And I wonder, mm -hmm. is the WHO advising other countries that have mink farms whether they need to do similar things, close them or cull their herds? Um, and are you also worried that this um, this spread to uh, livestock might happen with other types of livestock um, and with mutations happening and then it coming back into the human population? Um, thanks for this question. So I will begin, but we also have Dr. Peter Benenberg, who's online, who's our uh, animal-human interface focal point. So I will uh, like to ask him to, to supplement uh, this answer here. So yes, um, I'm sure you've seen the, the reports uh, of, the, of the circulation of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in minks. We've been seeing this for, for a number of months now. Um, and what we understand is, is the minks have been infected by, with contact from humans. It circulates in the mink, and then it can, it can pass back uh, to humans. And so there's always a concern when you have uh, circulation and transmission from human to animals and then animals to humans. Um, so there is a number of, of activities that are ongoing to understand um, the situation in Denmark. Uh, we had a very good call with our colleagues in the European Regional Office and ECDC and also the State Serum uh, Institute in Denmark. Um, and this is the group that is evaluating uh, the strains that are being identified in these mink. 
Um, and so uh, the findings that they've found, they've seen some variants uh, in some of these uh, strains that have some mutations. And I'd like to remind you that mutations are uh, normal. Um, these types of changes in the virus are something that we have been tracking since the beginning. Um, and you've heard me say many times uh, that WHO has a global laboratory network and we have a specific working group that is looking at virus evolution and looking at these changes. Um, each one of these changes, each one of these mutations, whether they're identified in, in mink or they're identified in humans, need to be evaluated because we need to determine the importance of each of these and if any of these changes means that the virus behaves differently. And there's a proper way to do that um, because there needs to be studies to evaluate uh, if there's any changes in transmissibility or severity and if there are any implications for diagnostics, for vaccines, and for therapeutics. Um, and in this uh, situation, there's a suggestion um, that some of these mutations may have some implications, but we need to do the proper studies to evaluate this. And that is ongoing right now with colleagues at, the, at SSI in Denmark, as well as our international working group. Um, we are working uh, with our regional offices in Europe, in Wipro, and in the Western Pacific, and in the Americas, um, where there are mink farms, um, because there are many mink farms all over the globe, and looking at the biosecurity on the mink farms, looking at the surveillance that's happening in these mink farms, um, and to support uh, countries in taking the right steps to, to prevent uh, the virus to continue to circulate in minks and to prevent spillover events from happening. Um, so the immediate steps that are taken in Denmark is to limit further spillover um, of, of the virus um, and then making sure that these minks um, are, are culled and that Denmark has made some announcements on how they are going to do that. Um, but I'd like to ask Peter if he could um, supplement this by talking about how we work with FAO and OIE and our partners in support of this. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Peter Benimbark, are you uh, online? Peter? Yes. 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 Please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes, we are, of course, working closely with our uh, colleagues in FAO and OIE who have the, uh, the more uh, uh, areas of expertise and speciality around uh, the different uh, animal species and the way they are bred and, uh, and the risk associated with that. And it's clear that with uh, mink, uh, different countries have different farming traditions and in some countries the farms are easier to protect in terms of biosecurity measures and so on than in other uh, countries and that explained partly why some countries have been able to control outbreaks in their mink population while other countries have had difficulties doing that. Uh, and to the second part of your question about the risk to see something happening uh, in a similar way in other uh, uh, animal species, uh, food animal species in particular, uh, there the risk is much less uh, for two reasons. Why is that the first uh, studies that have been conducted on pigs, chicken, cattle, and so on, uh, show that these species are not at all susceptible in the same way that uh, mink uh, are, for example. So even if these animals were infected, they would not be able to uh, sustain and spread the disease in the same way. And the second reason is that the way we produce uh, pigs and chickens in, uh, in particular in modern farming systems allow us to keep these environments totally uh, isolated and secured from a contamination point of view. So it will be much easier to contain uh, and uh, prevent uh, the disease coming into these environments if these species were uh, also susceptible to the virus. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Peter, uh, and I would echo your 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 words there on, on bio biosecurity. Uh, animals are farmed for all kinds of of, of different uh, reasons, and uh, it is really important when they're farmed on mass that we have adequate biosafety, adequate risk management measures, um, uh, and uh, this is an issue all over the world, uh, and it's something we continually speak about. The animal-human interface is uh, is very dynamic. Uh, and it is even in the even with having testing and having awareness of of, of SARS-CoV-2, uh, it's taken time to establish uh, how widespread this virus has been in the mink population, and then human to mink and mink to human transmission. It just shows how complex 
uh, and how dynamic this uh, interface is uh, and how complex some of the answers are when you, you try to work out the significance of any one of these events. I think that is what the teams are working together, scientists all over the world, uh, and on the EPI side, survey, uh, on the clinical side, on the laboratory side, are working together with our Danish colleagues to, to establish uh, uh, those facts. Um, the, um, uh, we, I, I, we have briefed and worked very closely with our colleagues in the European Regional Office with our Regional Director, Dr. Hans Kluge. Uh, we've also uh, been in close contact with the European Center for Disease Control. I know that uh, these the, this um, data are being sent around on the, in the European Early Warning and Response System, and I know the European Union is acting. ECDC is the, the surveillance center for the European Union, and I know the Danish colleagues are also reaching out across Europe uh, themselves. So there's a, a lot of very good work and coordination on, ongoing, and WHO we're just uh, in the process of completing a first risk assessment on this specific event, and we will be communicating with our member states in the, in the coming hours today. Thank you, Maria. Uh, in order to summarize the situation for all of our member states and, and any, uh, any ongoing risk, we'd like to thank everybody uh, from the country to the regional to the global level who are working with us. This is the work of science to establish the facts, uh, to assess the risks, uh, to manage those risks, uh, and do that in a flexible, rapid, and dynamic way. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. I would like now to pass the floor to Jamie Keaton from Associated uh, Press. Jamie, can you hear me? Good morning. Thank you so much, um, Padula. Um, this question, is, there's so many questions that I ask right now, but uh, um, there is one that's really pressing, and I hope that um, Dr. Tedros can address it. Um, as you may be paying attention, uh, the United States is in the midst of an election and um, President Joe Biden, or pre potentially President Joe Biden's administration, we may see. Um, and I'm just wondering um, how much contact you've had with, the, um, with Joe Biden's team and what kind of word have you had about um, whether or not, how quickly Joe Biden's administration would bring uh, the United States back into the um, fold at WHO. Thank you. Uh, Steve Solomon uh, will comment on any specifics. We would just like to uh, congratulate uh, all Americans for exercising the wonderful act of democracy uh, that's ongoing there right now and uh, to assure you that the, the World Health Organization is a member state organization. We continue to work with uh, the, the U.S. administration and, and we'll work with all U.S. administrations uh, uh, now and into the future. Steve? Thanks. Thanks, Mike. I can only re reiterate that the Secretariat, based on principles of neutrality, works with all administrations. We will continue to work with the uh, administrations in all of our member states and uh, do so cooperatively and in accordance with the principles set down in the Constitution and any decisions that the World Health Assembly adopts in that regard. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I would like now to invite Adela Suleiman from NBC to ask the next question. Adela, can you hear me? Hi there. Yes. Just going back to the meat communication question. I mean, you say you're doing a risk assessment and you're staying on top of it, but how worried should everyday people be? And secondly, will this dash any prospect of a Vaccine. Um, um, Sumia may wish to comment on, on the specifics uh, regarding uh, vaccines. No, it, the, I, I think it's very important to recognize that these types of things happen all the time. This is a global pandemic and many millions of people are infected and many millions of animals have been exposed and we've seen different types of animals who've uh, been themselves infected with this virus. And there's always a potential that the virus can then come back to humans. Uh, and, and that is a concern because mammal species like mink uh, are very uh, good hosts in a sense, and the virus can, can evolve within those species, especially if they're large numbers are packed closely together. So in that sense, we have to look at that viral evolution. We have to create the biosecurity around farms like that so that there's not that contact back with human populations uh, and we have to address all of those issues but no it, it right now 
the, 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 the evidence that we have uh, doesn't suggest that this variant is in any way different in the way it behaves. Uh, it may have a, a slightly different signature, but it is still the same virus. What we have to evaluate over time is whether that virus has any difference in transmission or clinical severity or whether there is any implication for diagnostics of vaccines. But we're a long, long way away from making any determination of that kind. Uh, and uh, Sumia may comment on the vaccine issue. I know this concerns people, but I believe we're a long way from making any determination there. And uh, but Sumia is an expert in this field, so I will defer to her knowledge and wisdom. Maybe just to add to what uh, Mike has said, I think it's, um, it's too early to really jump uh, to conclusions as to the implications of what uh, the, the, these specific mutations have, either for transmission or for uh, the severity of the disease clinical presentation or indeed for the immune response and potentially vaccine efficacy. So I think so far we've been tracking these mutations. As you know, we have over 170,000 whole genome sequences now in GISAID, and there's scientific work going on around the world, and WHO is leading a group as well that look, that's looking. It's a group of evolutionary biologists and experts on bioinformatics that's constantly tracking these changes and mutations that are happening, and we've seen plenty of them. So I think we, we need to wait and see what the implications are, but uh, I, I don't think we should we should uh, come to any conclusions about whether this particular mutation is going to impact vaccine efficacy or not. We don't have any evidence at the moment that it, that it would. But we will update you as we, we get more information. Uh, thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. I would like now to invite Laurent Siro from ATS, uh, Swiss News Agency, to ask the next question. Laurent, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me, Fadela? Uh, very well, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, there's been in the recent days a small controversy here in Switzerland about the solidarity between the different uh, linguistic regions in, uh, in the way uh, hospitals and health centers uh, accept to, to, uh, to treat uh, people from other uh, centers, so the solidarity between health centers. I'd like to know whether you have a global assessment on, on the way it works worldwide and maybe uh, also in, in Europe. Thank you. Um, it, it's difficult, difficult to make any specific comment on a specific situation, but uh, if we look at this globally, we've actually seen huge solidarity within countries and between countries, especially when it comes to the clinical care of patients. We've seen thousands of health workers go to areas to provide assistance when that was needed in particular areas, and we've seen transfer of patients out of areas to areas where they could receive better uh, clinical care or intensive care as emergency rooms and intensive care units came under pressure in certain areas. The, 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 the DG speaks all the time about solidarity and science, solidarity and solutions. Uh, we, we don't do good science without solidarity. We don't do good clinical care without solidarity, and frankly, we don't behave ourselves in communities to prevent the transmission of infection without that solidarity. We need to support each other as individuals, as communities, and within health systems. But we, our overall assessment globally, I would suggest, indicates a massive outpouring of scientific and healthcare solidarity, uh, and, and many federalized systems putting aside the differences between the systems and any uh, rivalries or difficulties and, and finding ways to, to help each other. It's not always easy because sharing resources in a crisis is tough when you're not quite sure uh, how you're going to need those resources potentially in a few days' time. That is a very difficult thing to do. It's a very big step um, uh, from an operational planning point of view and also spiritually just to offer others assistance when you may need uh, those resources yourself. We encourage uh, people to continue uh, to do that going forward. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ryan. I would like now to invite uh, the reporter from Jakarta Post, Ardila Svakria, to ask the next question. Ardila, can you hear me? Jakarta Post. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Go ahead, please. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, can I still address a question to Indonesian minister or? Yes. Um, yes, he's still uh, with us. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay. So uh, as uh, Dr. Tedros said, um, the IR has allowed countries to learn about what worked and what did not work in the countries in, his, in terms of their response to COVID-19. I'd like to ask the minister, uh, so from the IAR that Indonesia has conducted, what didn't work and how... Uh, uh, yeah. Ardila, you were cut off. Can you hear me? Ardila, can you hear me? Hi. Hi. Yeah, we, lo we lost can you. you. Can you just repeat uh, the last part of your question? Okay, okay. so I'd like to ask um, what, uh, from the IAR that Indonesia has conducted, mm -hmm. what kind of response and um, um, that didn't work in Indonesia and how Indonesia, uh, the government has been trying to prove it? Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Ardila. Um, the Minister of Indonesia, uh, can, did, did you hear the question? Yeah. Thank you very much, Adila, for your post, or Jakarta post. IER is intended to be a platform for continual learning. Based on the IER recommendation, we have expanded the laboratories network and referral hospital as well as conducting massive recruitment of contact tracer and training for contact tracing. Ministry of Health and all of the government of Indonesia has conducted effort in the nine pillars of the COVID-19 strategic response. The, the IER is served as a tool to review or respond systematically, identify strength and gaps so that we can future improve our response. One of the challenges during IER is because of large-scale social restriction. We have to conduct the IER via video conference. So there is challenge in engaging the participant of the review. However, we have managed to combine the IER with the use of participant perception survey filled by all participants that presented at the review. In this way, we were able to capture a more in deep and comprehensive input from the participant. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister uh, from Indonesia. Um, we have now a journalist joining from uh, South Africa, uh, from City Press. You have the floor. Hmm? I think uh, it's Yuyo Madolo from City Press, South Africa. You have the floor. Yes. yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Very well. Go ahead, please. Hi there. It's actually William Kize from City Press newspaper in South Africa. Um, I have a question for Minister Mkize. Um, he had spoken um, about the country having an indication of clusters in, of cases in certain areas. Um, we've seen a report showing that in the Eastern Cape alone, um, there were 758 new cases on Thursday and growing hospitalizations. Um, is there a confirmed um, resurgence in that province? Um, and can you talk us through that province's plan to mitigate against a resurgence and um, you know the, 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 the factors that are influencing influencing this rise in cases. Thank you. Thank you, you all. Um, Honorable Minister of South Africa, uh, Minister Mkizi, are you online? Yes, thank you. So, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you for the question. Indeed, uh, we are observing in a number of areas where there are cluster outbreaks that are showing uh, some uh, the areas where we've picked this up. Uh, been some areas such as in the Western Cape, in the Eastern Cape, uh, we get these clusters and therefore we have to go in and make an assessment as to to what extent do they constitute cumulatively uh, what we should call a resurgence. So we are 
uh, observing the fact that there is activity that is showing uh, numbers that are a bit higher <clears throat> in some of the areas such as Nelson Mandela Bay and some of the uh, border uh, areas bordering the two provinces of East and West uh, <clears throat> provinces, mainly due to uh, some of the movement, particularly seasonal uh, uh, farm workers and so on. So the, there's work that's being done on a regular basis so that you can uh, class, uh, classify it as a resurgence when we've actually got all the uh, factors properly uh, evaluated. But there are clusters, we are looking at all of them, and uh, at the right time, <clears throat> we'll be able to indicate whether in fact there's something that requires additional action. The province has had uh, quite a, a, an improvement in the Eastern Cape with the new team that was set in place to go and help to improve the response. And so over the past, since July coming this way, we have seen a lot of improvement and therefore some of their capacity in terms of bed numbers, oxygen utilization uh, have actually not really been ever exceeded. And so we do believe that if there's any change, we should be able to respond as we have done in the past. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like now to pass the floor to Mark Webster from CGTN. Mark, uh, can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to follow up on the Danish question, Mark Webster from CGTA. Uh, it, it really is, as I understood it, that there is this particular mutation doesn't pose any immediate danger, according to your experts. So therefore, presumably, it would be totally premature to carry out a mass cull of mink. Thank you, uh, Mark. It's a, uh, yeah. So thank you. I didn't actually hear a, a question in there, um, but what we can, what I can say is, what is the the situation as we as we know it, as we've described? Um, so there are variations in these viruses that are identified in in mink, and in the specific situation, the specific situation that we're talking about in Denmark is there's one virus variant that has been found in 12 individuals, 12 humans, um, and so what the authorities are doing is that they are looking for the extent. Uh, of infection if there are other cases with this particular variant. Uh, and the reason that this variant is of concern is some preliminary studies, which must be confirmed, and there are more studies that need to be done to really understand if there are any changes in the behavior of this particular variant, and if there are any implications down the road, as we have described as it relates to diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. But there is a process that's in place. I mean, the question that was earlier is it was, what does this mean for the everyday person and how worried, worried should I be? I think what is important for the everyday person is to understand that there is surveillance that is ongoing, that is looking. There um, are sequences, full genome sequences that are being shared. And if anything I can stress today is that we need more sequences to be shared. Um, as this virus continues to circulate the globe, as we see it in, in mink in different populations, those sequences need to be shared because they need to be evaluated. They need to be studied. They need to be discussed. Um, and that needs to continue, and we need scientists to be able to continue to share those, those sequences. So that's really, really important. But in the current situation, what um, the Danish authorities have outlined are a series of steps that they have put in place to limit the ability of the virus or these viruses, and there are different variants that are found in mink, to spill over and to pass from minks to humans. Um, because we don't want to establish a new reservoir, a new animal reservoir for this virus. Um, and so those are the steps that are being put in place. And also to make sure that we are still continuing to, to do surveillance in humans, increase sequencing capacity in, in many different countries. Um, so I think that's what's important in the, in the situation now. And for you to understand that there is a process in place to, each, to evaluate each and every one of these mutations to determine their importance. Uh, yes, and just, just to add in terms of adding to your your question about the decision of the Danish health authorities, and Peter alluded to this earlier. The, and this happens all over the world every day as we raise, we raise animals uh, 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 around the world. Uh, the issue in terms of the decision you make whether to call or not call is based on a number of things. Well, first of all is the extent of that, vir that infection in that animal population. Um, uh, and the concerns you may have about ev viral evolution in that animal population, how efficient that particular virus is at spreading within that animal population and how fast it could evolve. 
The second is the bio-risk management around those facilities. And there are many countries in the world in many situations, uh, uh, Peter referred to the, to the, to the pig and, and poultry farming sector, which have very strict biosecurity in place to, to prevent any virus jumping uh, back into humans. So when you assess that bio-risk and biosecurity measures in place. And then the third factor in making that decision are the implications for human health in terms of the likelihood of that disease causing more problems back uh, in the human side in terms of severity or transmission or diagnostics. Those three factors have to be looked at together. It's not one in isolation. And the sovereign authority then has to make a determination between its veterinary and its human health authority on what represents the best decision for both veterinary health, for human health, um, and uh, the Danish authorities are, are looking at all of that evidence, they're, they're making decisions in real time, they're taking uh, strong action, uh, and we will continue to work with the scientific community to understand the implications of, of the findings, but the, in the meantime, the Danish authorities have to base their actions on their, the extent of the virus within that mink population, the bio-risk management available around that population, and concerns around any health impact in humans. And as we've said, we've already seen a number of cases on, on the human side of the equation. And this is then going to take time to fully understand the implications of this, uh, as Sumia alluded to, uh, and that's our job. We have to get on with that on the clinical and scientific and laboratory side of things. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to come back to the first question uh, from uh, a journalist, Travel News Asia, asking specifically about the situation in Thailand. Uh, we have uh, the deputy director um, from the Ministry of Health of Thailand who would like to take this question. Um, can you hear me, Dr. Tanaka? You are uh, muted. Can you please unmute yourself? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the question and give us an opportunity to answer this question. Um, in Thailand, we plan to um, reduce the quarantine days from 14 days down to 10 days, but not for every country. Um, we plan to um, implement it to the low risk country first. And then after 10 days, um, the travelers can come out of the quarantine, but they, they still need to report to Ministry of Public Health and they will have um, what we call limited um, travel. They can travel, but um, their schedule have to be reported um, to to the authorities and then they, and they can travel to um, only a few limited spots and they cannot go into the large um, gathering or they cannot go into certain places where we still prohibited them to, to go. Um, so that is our plan um, to reduce um, the quarantine days to 10 days. And we hope that um, with this plan, we can, we can still be very, very safe in um, taking the traveler into our countries and prevent um, the, the case from, from increasing as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I would like just to give the full name uh, of the speaker, Dr. Tanarak Plipat. Uh, he is Deputy Director General, <laughs> Department of Disease Control, Ministry of Public Health, Thailand. Thank you, doctor. Um, I would like now to ask the reporter from GG Press to uh, ask the next question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much for taking my question. Um, my question is about Taiwan, and I would appreciate if Dr. Tedros could answer this. Um, many countries and associations are again demanding WHO to accept Taiwan as an observer to the World Health Assembly next week. So my question is, um, if uh, I'd like to know if you are going to invite Taiwan as an observer to the meeting. If not, please tell us why. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to invite Steve Solomon, uh, Principal Legal Officer, to take this question. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, and thank you for that question. The um, resume session of the 73rd World Health Assembly will begin on Monday, so this question is very timely. But before I answer your question, and I will answer your question, uh, related to that very importantly is the issue of technical issues, uh, technical health issues. And on technical health issues, WHO works with everyone everywhere, in Taiwan, China, everywhere. Um, and uh, this helps ensure that there is no gap in achieving one of the principles of our Constitution. I'm going to read that principle because it is so important. Uh, the principle is that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic, or social condition. This principle is written into the DNA of WHO staff. So our technical work with Taiwanese health experts is very broad-based. It focuses on COVID. It focuses on a broad range of health areas. Uh, we've, re we've shared that with you. You can find a list of these areas where we cooperate technically with Taiwanese health experts and health authorities uh, on our website. And that is available and that is kept updated. But I will take a moment just to give three uh, important new developments in that area of our work with Taiwanese health authorities. Uh, first, we are working with them through the COVAX facility. That is the uh, facility that is designed to ensure equity with respect to the development and access to COVID vaccines. We are working with them through the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework, which is a framework designed to strengthen protections and safeguards with respect to pandemic influenza. And we are working with them through direct discussions and conferences. And in fact, uh, with Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, we briefed Taiwanese CDC officials just this week, and that is an ongoing effort. Now, I, as to your question with respect to observership, uh, with respect to observership, that is participation in the governing bodies of the World Health Organization, particularly the World Health Assembly, uh, what WHO is is the key point to understand here. WHO is an intergovernmental organization. This means that countries make the policy decisions. The DG and the Secretariat must operate within the context of those decisions and in accordance with those decisions. In 1972, member states at the World Health Assembly passed a resolution which says that the People's Republic of China is the, quote, only legitimate representative of China to WHO. That resolution still stands. And Taiwanese involvement at the Health Assembly as an observer continues to be a question for member states. In fact, since 1997, this question has come up 14 times. And each time, member states have decided against inviting Taiwan as an observer. The question will come up again at the Assembly on Monday. There is a proposal for what is called a supplementary agenda item. That proposal is made by 14 member states. Again, if you're interested in that list of member states, it is on our website. Uh, that proposal is procedurally correct under the Constitution because this is an issue for member states. In sum, observership is a question for member states and technical work, technical work of the Secretariat, of the Director General, with everyone everywhere, continues to ensure that we advance the principle of health for all as it's embodied in our Constitution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh so much. Um, this virtual press conference uh, has been now in progress for more, one, more than an hour, but I would like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Van Kerkhove for uh, additional information. Thanks, Fidel. I'll be very brief. Um, just to supplement what, what Steve has said on the interaction with uh, Taiwan colleagues, scientific colleagues, um, there has been an active, really wonderful exchange uh, with colleagues and scientists from Taiwan CDC and others. Um, I've briefed them myself four times uh, throughout this pandemic, um, and it's been an exchange of sharing, you know, the global situation and some of the recent concerns we have, but also hearing from them as well. 
uh, how they've handled uh, the pandemic and and the current situation there, and 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 um, and then an exchange of lots of questions uh, back and forth. So it's been a really good, very positive exchange. And also, we have a number of scientists who are part of our technical networks, as, as Steve has said, and have been part of our technical networks throughout. So on on a, on a scientific level, it's really great. And we work with, as Steve has said again, and as the director general has said, we work with everyone everywhere. Uh, we're all in this together, and we are all constantly learning from each other. So on the scientific front, the solidarity and the unity and the, the collaboration that we have seen in this is really um, heartening, um, and it will continue uh, throughout. Thank you. Um, before I pass the floor to Dr. Tedros, Dr. Ryan would like to say something. <clears throat> no, I just wanted to just reflect for a second. and It was great to, to hear the feedback from the countries regarding the interaction review process. Uh, we'd just like to recognize the, the huge amount of work that's gone on inside our organization with partners to develop the approaches and the methodologies uh, to learn, adapt, and implement uh, from all of the work we've done before on preparedness and uh, to, uh, to Landry Maigane, to uh, Sir Ludi Suyanto, to Stella Chungang. Thank you, Stella, for your leadership and to Jawad Major, our Assistant Director General for Preparedness, because this is the work that goes on in this organization day after day, week after week, year after year, <clears throat> building the capacity uh, and the, and the, it, within countries to both manage the epidemic response process, but also prepare for epidemics. The approach in the IAR is a collaborative approach. It's about learning lessons, not casting blame. It's about doing better not for the for after action reviews and others it's about doing better in the next pandemic the interaction review process is about doing better next week next month it's about saving more lives <clears throat> it's about stopping more transmission uh, it's really important work it can appear formulaic at times but it is not it is the essence of success in epidemic response <clears throat> as a great sports uh, uh, coach once said if you're if you fail to prepare, you prepare, you prepare to fail. And uh, in this regard, I just want to recognize the work of our staff and all of the partners in this regard. So um, that's important for, for me to say. I don't know, Stella, if you want to say any, anything on, on, on your role in, in driving this forward. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, as we've heard across from all the excellencies and the countries, uh, the, the interaction review is really an excellent and great opportunity to bring together every stakeholder from different sectors in a country to analyze collectively the successes, the strengths, but also the challenges that have, have uh, occurred during uh, the pandemic and to course correct and to, to adapt their response. But it's also an opportunity to update and validate their, their strategic response and preparedness plans and to document, apply lessons and uh, share with others. It is really uh, important as we've looked across the 21 countries that have already um, uh, done their interaction reviews that a number of strong success stories have come out, uh, including the, the, the strong coordination and leadership that is lead, needed at the highest levels and uh, the whole of society approach, bringing all sectors, including the communities, into the discussions. It is around the flexibility of, uh, and, and, and possibility of repurposing key staff and the workforce towards where the greatest needs are in terms of the pandemic response. It is about ramping up the diagnosis and the test, test that, uh, um, testing that occurs in countries, but not only ending there, following through with appropriate public health measures in terms of contact tracing, quarantining of contacts, and isolation of uh, the sick. We, some challenges too have come up across the, the 21 countries that have uh, conducted IARs. And these, especially in the early phase of the response, where the lack of equipment supplies and robust uh, supply chains and procurement processes have been identified as a challenge and one that should be addressed in moving forward for other countries. But also the community levels, uh, empowerment and participation, as well as the surveillance at the points of entries, providing timely information for evidence-based decision-making 
and the ability to have in place business continuity plans, especially ones that would allow the provision of essential services and, 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 and in, the, in the countries. So um, it, is, it is really important that countries continue to conduct the intra-action reviews and, and uh, that they continue also to integrate the findings into their strategic plans, but not only that, into their national action plans, as we see that many countries are actually facing concomitant outbreaks along with the pandemic. It is important also that countries should continue to share their reports and their experiences with other countries and with the global community. Thank you. Thank you, Star. Powerful words. Um, and one last thing, I know Fidel, you're going to kill me, but uh, I just want to reflect and amplify one, one message from the Director General's um, speech. <clears throat> because so many hundreds of thousands of workers, millions of health workers and others have worked for decades to bring measles under control uh, and, and try to uh, eradicate polio. Um, the appeal today being launched by WHO and UNICEF is close to the heart of so many national and international health workers. Uh, we've got so close uh, in polio eradication. We're getting closer in measles, though we've taken a few steps back. We need to reignite <coughs> immunization as a primary, um, uh, the primary measure within primary health care. It is absolutely vital we don't uh, potentially win a battle against COVID and lose a battle against polio or measles at the same time. <coughs> Too many people have sacrificed too much. So I would just add my voice to the call today to, to, to use polio and measles as a way of reigniting our immunization systems. And in doing that, we will, number one, reach some very cherished goals that we have. Number two, we will build the power and the agility and the flexibility and the effectiveness of the immunization systems we're going to need to be able to be successful in the delivery and safe vaccination against uh, COVID-19. These two objectives are mutually aligned, they're mutually supportive, um, and polio uh, eradication and measles elimination represent <clears throat> some of the most cherished goals of mankind. So let's try to get behind the appeal launched by WHO and UNICEF today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Uh, I would like now to invite Dr. Tedros for final comments. Over to you, DG. Thank you. Can you hear me? Very well. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to, first of all, uh, conquer with what uh, Mike and Stella have uh, said. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, His uh, Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister Chernavirakul, His Excellency Minister Mikize, and His Excellency Minister Putra, Putran, Putranto uh, for joining us today and for sharing their experience on interaction reviews. Thank you so much also to all uh, journalists who have joined us uh, today. And see you in our uh, next presser. Thank you. Have a nice day. Uh, thank you, Dr.